Good evening and um, welcome to this second lecture in the series since uh, we are exploring the initially the origins of Indian civilization we cannot avoid uh, a famous perennial I should say controversy which is the Aryan controversy uh, this is a recurring question mark uh, put by students and um, adults alike and it is also a, a major question which has repercussions in many fields uh, you, you will understand in a few minutes what I mean by that um, it determines in a way the the origin of Indian civilization since uh, the Aryan invasion or migration theory uh, assumes or holds that Aryans came from outside India I'll give the details very shortly and basically imported the fundamentals of Indian civilization that is to say they imported uh, they, they brought with them Sanskrit language they brought uh, the Vedas they brought a certain social order which was uh, based on the caste system and uh, the, these things in many ways are important ingredients of the later classical Indian civilization that we will see in the next lecture the, the Ganges civilization uh, you know which began in the first millennium BC uh, which culminated for instance in the Mauryan Empire and so on so it is an important question because uh, it boils down to whether those important ingredients of Indian civilization are indigenous or not uh, but then it also puts the question of what is the relationship between this classical Ganges civilization starting first millennium BC and the Indus civilization which we saw the other day which began which uh, flourished in the third millennium BC is there no connection at all or, or uh, do we find uh, still some legacy lingering on so uh, to start with I chose a evocative uh, picture from a textbook used in some schools in Tamil Nadu in fact in my city of Coimbatore this is where I picked it up one day accidentally and you see a very uh, you know that you see in fact the Aryans sacking a Harappan city and um, slaughtering the hapless Harappans uh, uh, mercilessly and uh, destroying the, therefore the Indus civilization so this um, you know Hollywood Hollywoodian scenario or maybe Bollywoodian if you prefer I don't know uh, is what uh, our children uh, still learn at school uh, it depends a little bit and CRT uh, textbooks have softened the whole they still go by the the Aryan invasion theory but in a in a much more discreet manner but in this kind of textbooks and especially in the south where as you might know the the Aryan uh, invasion theory is a kind of a, uh, essential dogma because without it the so-called Dravidian parties would have no ideology left not that they have much left anyway but uh, so the, this is what students learn and in this case in class 4 and uh, you have another picture on the left which shows uh, the, uh, the uh, Aryans you know uh, riding across perhaps Central Asia uh, before they reach finally the Indian subcontinent so what the students learn and you have to imagine the psychology of a child of class 4 is that the earliest inhabitants of India were the Dravidians that's already quite a tall order and please note that the word Dravidian is not defined we're not told what is a Dravidian who is a Dravidian uh, who were the people who lived in Mohanjo-daro and Harappa second very tall claim the Aryans migrated from Central Asia and drove away the Dravidians after fierce battles that's a third uh, tall claim the culture of the Aryans was uh, entirely different from that of the Dravidians so within a very short paragraph which of course students have to learn by heart please remember uh, 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 an imprint is created and uh, naturally you know the, the a Tamilian child will be immediately building up some resentment against those wicked Aryans who slaughtered their ancestors so this is the kind of picture we still have 
today in India. Now, more seriously, what does the theory consist in? It, we have, therefore, uh, uh, the notion of a new people speaking an early form of Sanskrit. You know, Vedas are not in classical Sanskrit. They are in Vedic Sanskrit. It's an archaic form. They're supposed to have entered India about the second, uh, uh, middle of the second millennium BC and either brutally conquered or in softer versions today uh, somehow dominated local populations to the extent that they could spread their language, their Vedic culture and their uh, caste-based social order. So this is the, the essence of the theory as it stands. So we have two versions, the hard one which is that they destroyed the Indus cities and this is still uh, taught in many textbooks and a softer one which is that since they came in 1500 BC and the, I told you the other day that the Indus civilization so stops, collapses at least in its state structure, in its urban <coughs> uh, order, by 1900 BC there is a gap and therefore uh, the, the new proponents of the are in migration theory, as it is now called, say that, well, they entered and uh, somehow they, they still subjugated the local populations, whoever they were, and spread their culture, etc. So, uh, the, and then, then we have the fact that the Rig Veda does speak of battles between the Aryas. Mm? Aryas, we will have to define what an Arya is. In fact, let me say it straight away. In the Veda, the Arya is very clearly uh, somebody who fights for a cosmic order called Ritam by the side of the gods and the rishis. This is the Arya. The Arya is one who uh, observes properly the rituals, pronounces the mantras correctly and fights for that cosmic order. This is the definition. In fact, there is no notion of a, 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 an, Arya, an Aryan people. It doesn't exist in the Vedas. When the, Veda, the Rig Veda starts talking about uh, peoples, it speaks of Panchajanna, five peoples. And they have other names. They are the Bharatas, the Purus, the Kurus, the Druyus, and the uh, Anus, if I remember correctly. So there is never a notion that Aryas constitute a, a population in the Rig Veda. But they have adversaries. They are the Dasyus or Dasas, which I will return to. And if you read the uh, usual history textbooks, you are told that those were dark skinned and stub nosed. And therefore, they were very good candidates to be uh, portrayed as, you know, original tribes or Dravidians or whatever. This is what it boils down to. Now, how do we approach such a problem in an intelligent way? And many scholars have debated it, debated it uh, since um, something like uh, 1820, 1830. This is where uh, this whole discussion begins. And we have many approaches. Uh, one is, of course, literary. We have to look into the texts. That alone is a huge exercise, but I'll just show a few highlights. Geographical, we have some important clues in the Rig Veda. Archaeological, of course, we'll have to see whether, whether we have traces of this invasion, actual manifestations of it, because if after all an entire people entered India and uh, uh, crossed the whole northwest of India to penetrate the Gangetic Plains, uh, you would expect that there are some archaeological left. They are supposed to have brought a different culture. So this leaves physical traces. Then anthropological and genetic, we are told it's a different people, right? So uh, do we, can we detect uh, if perhaps with uh, different physical types in the skeletal remains uh, or genetic studies pointing to a sudden, uh, uh, you know, change in the, in the gene pool, etc. So this is an important, uh, especially in the last 30 years, important new field of research. Cultural, because we are told, as the textbook says, that Aryans had a totally different culture from that of the supposed original inhabitants. So can we detect any uh, radical change in the culture of the, of the north uh, of, of the subcontinent? 
Now six, I will not be able to deal with this uh, today because it becomes too vast. There's a lot of very interesting astronomical evidence uh, in Vedic texts and late Vedic texts which does give dates which curiously are almost all of them located in the third, fourth and even beyond a millennium BC. And uh, this is something which scholars who defend the Aryan uh, invasion or migration theory usually do not deal with because it's very embarrassing to, for example, uh, I may just mention briefly one example, the Shatapata Brahmana, which is a, a commentary on one of the Vedas, uh, mentions that when you build the fire altars, you should face the east. You know, the, pri the priest sits uh, uh, facing the east. I will come back to this point. Uh, later on today. And uh, uh, how do you determine the east? Well, you choose the point where the Kritika, that is to say the Pleiades uh, star cluster, is rising because Kritika never swerves from the east. And this is something which happened for a large part of the year in a pro sometime between 2400 and 3100 BC, not afterwards because of the precession of the equinoxes. So we have certain dates like that which keep recurring and uh, this would require a whole treatment of itself. Uh, there are many dates but none of them are compatible uh, with uh, uh, an invasion taking place in 1500 BC. They are much older. Finally, linguistic. Now, linguistic again is, is a vast field and it's a very technical field. In fact, I'm not very competent in it but I've studied whatever I could as a layman and what I've seen is that the Aryan invasion theory originally has two uh, uh, raison d'etre, two you know, uh, purposes. One is that you, the scholars right from the late 18th century, William Jones, needed to explain the newly discovered connection between Sanskrit and the European languages like Greek and Latin. That connection is obvious, it is absolutely non-controversial. And this is wha what actually gave the name to the Indo-European family of languages, which includes all North Indian languages, except a few tribal ones, and uh, uh, Iran Iranian, Persian, and uh, languages like uh, Afghani, and all European languages basically, except a few like Basque and so on. Now, this needs, requires an explanation. How come this huge region has a single uh, uh, family of languages. Um, the easy explanation was, of course, to imagine a population somewhere uh, in the center of gravity of that region, which could be, uh, you know, the Black Sea, which could be Southern Russia, which could be Central Asia, and imagining this population to radiate in all directions, which is, which is what was done. Uh, but then there is... A, a, a simplification here, which is that we image, we have to imagine to accept the so-called tree model of linguistics, where we imagine a common root and all languages nicely branching out of this common root. And this model has been increasingly disputed, uh, rather complexified, because it's not as if languages simply emerge from a common root. They also keep interacting laterally. And lateral interactions uh, are equally important and uh, uh, end up creating convergences, divergences. For example, in India, South Indian languages, so-called Dravidian languages, uh, are definitely from a different family. They are not Indo-European languages. Nevertheless, there's been interaction for so many, well, centuries or millennia, we don't, whatever, that in fact, they have tended to converge. And if uh, this process continues, one day, for a, a, a modern observer who doesn't know past linguistics, uh, he, may, he may find that uh, South Indian and North Indian languages belong to a single family. It is possible. This has happened in the past. So this uh, has led a number of linguists to finally agree that the Indo-European family of languages can have different kinds of explanations. And it can be migrations, but it need not also be migrations. Uh, an increasing number of linguists prefer mechanisms of interaction where populations do not actually move, but keep being in contact. So uh, this field is complex. I will only say that even though 
con mainstream conventional linguists still prefer the Aryan invasion or migration model. Uh, uh, some others do not, and they acknowledge that uh, you know, the question remains open from their point of view. So we have to start with the, I'll select only the first five fields, and that too I can cover on, only briefly. First, the literary evidence. And uh, the main thing which uh, scholars immediately noted is that if Aryans had come into India, and then they settled on the banks of the Indus or its tributaries or the Sarasvati, because Sarasvati, as we will see, is very frequently mentioned in the Rig Veda, you would expect them to carry with them memories of their homeland, you know, the, the, of their long uh, travel through, through uh, Central Asia at least, and then the crossing of the Afghan passes and so on. Uh, you know, these would have been uh, something which would have remained important culturally in the, in the memory of that people. There is absolutely no such trace. Despite valiant efforts by many scholars, the Rig Veda is absolutely silent about any land outside India. Uh, in fact, its territory, its geography, as we will see, is basically northwest of the Indian subcontinent. So this is embarrassing. <coughs> and Shri Aurobindo, in 1915, even before him, <coughs> Swami Vivekananda had already made similar statements. He said there is actually no mention of such an invasion. There is no reliable indication of any racial difference between uh, so-called Aryans and <coughs> the Dasyus who are supposed to be the uh, original inhabitants subjug subjugated by the Aryans. Even modern scholars, George Erdosi, who is both an Indologist and an archaeologist from Canada, recently wrote even apparently clear indications of historical struggles between dark aborigines in the Rig Veda and Arya conquerors turn out to be misleading. So we, we have to be very cautious with the text. In fact, typical example is how do we conclude that the Dasyus are dark-skinned? They're not dark-skinned. The Rig Veda never says that they are dark-skinned. It says that they are wrapped in darkness. They are wrapped in a thick envelope or cover uh, of darkness. Now this is something which is not the same as being dark skinned. And in many mythologies of the world, you know that when you have a battle in Greek mythology for example between forces of light or good and forces of evil or darkness, you, you will represent the, de the demons, whoever they are, as you know basically dark. Uh, even in popular uh, Amar Chitra Katas, when an Asura is depicted, you know he's depicted as being dark skinned. It doesn't mean that he belongs to a different race. It simply means that there is, you know, something dark about him. So we have to be careful not to use figurative or metaphorical language on a very literary footing and to, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to deduct biological facts from uh, what is essentially a metaphor. Stubb knows the same thing. There is one passage in the Rig Veda, and only one, which is that the Dasyus are depicted as Anasa. Now, Max Muller translated Anasa as, as uh, Anasa, which therefore would be noseless, and all scholars after him started saying that, well, the Dasyus are noseless, and therefore they are Dravidians, as if South Indians had no nose worth the name. <laughs> Uh, but uh, somehow this was the impression, and, uh, and this is just because of one single occurrence in, in, in uh, you know, 1,200 and, uh, uh, no, 1,024 hymns. In fact, the traditional interpretation of Anasa in India by Sayana, the Vedic commentator of the 15th century, had been not Anasa, but Anasa, which means mouthless. And the Veda constantly insists on this notion that those who really are the Aryas are those who pronounce correctly the mantras. If you cannot pronounce the Vedic mantras correctly, they have no efficacy. So mouthless means, and this is made clear by other passages, those who actually cannot pronounce or those who sometimes corrupt the, the mantras, the Vedic speech. So this is what it means and not Knows this. You can see how easy it is to slip into predetermined 
interpretations. And <coughs> the second <coughs> remarkable point of the literary evidence is that what about those Dravidians? They're supposed to have been either slaughtered or driven to South India. And uh, we do have in, in uh, uh, Tamil an ancient literature called the Sangam literature, which the earliest layers of which go back to possibly 200, 300 BC at the most. And uh, well, there are many uh, uh, traditions, legends, uh, stories which are part of it. And the striking thing is that there is not one of them which refers ever to this grand scenario of, you know, having been uh, driven away from their cities and uh, 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 hunted all the way to South India. There is absolutely no such memory of a clash, whether physical, cultural, religious, or any. The only clash with the Arya kings, as the Sangam literature calls them, meaning North Indian kings, are of a military nature, where many Tamil kings boast of having gone to North India and conquered this king, that king, uh, brought back uh, waters from Ganga and stones from the Himalayas and such things. So this has nothing to do with the Aryan invasion theory. And in fact, the Sangam literature is highly respectful of the Vedas. It considers that the Brahmanas who uh, sing the Vedic hymns are to be revered, to be respected. Uh, all the rituals depicted are basically Vedic rituals. If you see the, the wedding of uh, Kannagi and Kovalan in the Shilaparikaram, uh, uh, they walk around a fire altar seven times and so on and so forth. So uh, th there is plenty of evidence <coughs> to show that we have no, neither memory of such an event but also no cultural clash. Now let me go to the, <coughs> sorry, doesn't matter, geographic evidence. First of all, and surprisingly, there are lots of references in the Rig Veda to the ocean. And this is something that was initially swept under the carpet because it was very embarrassing. The Aryas are supposed to have migrated from Central Asia, which is of course landlocked. And then they enter the plains of the uh, uh, Indus and Sarasvati. It's a long time before they are going to be in touch with the, the ocean, the Arabian Sea, long enough for it to be absorbed into their culture. Yet, they talk of ships, they talk of an eastern and western sea, they talk of sailing, storms, waves, and uh, the, the ocean, oceanic imagery is very strong, in fact, in the Rig Veda. So this is already an incompatibility with the migration uh, theory. So the theory, the, 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 the geography of the Rig Veda is basically this Sapta Sindhava. And uh, Sapta Sindhava is not defined, but then the rivers are constantly named elsewhere. So the scholars have put it together and the, the consensus, one or two disagree, but the consensus is that those Sapta Sindhava are the Indus itself, which is Sindhu. But then Sindhu, you see, words are always fluid in, in Vedic times and names are fluid. So Sindhu is that river, but because it is a mighty river, it can be applied often to any river. And it can also be applied to sometimes even the, uh, a large body of water because it is so large. So, uh, so we have to be very careful in, in the Vedic context uh, you know, to, to try to correlate uh, any conclusion we want to reach with all appearances of this particular word or phrase or designation. So, but then it has five tributaries, so that's six, and then there is the Saraswati. Saraswati is mentioned about 72 times in the Rig Veda, either as a goddess in Rig Veda, she is the goddess of inspiration, she is prayed to for inspiration. Uh, in the Yajur Veda, which is a little later, she becomes the goddess of speech, Vaj. And of course you know her future evolution as goddess of knowledge, arts, education, and so on. And, um, but then she is also invoked as a river. And she is a mighty river, Maho Arna Sarasvati. Uh, she flows from the mountain to the sea, Giribya Asamudrat. And her flow is unbroken. These are the descriptions we get. And of course there are also hymns where she is both, both river and goddess. Interestingly, Sarasvati in Rig Veda is the only river to be deified, to be turned into a goddess. And it's also the only river that disappears because 
where is the where is the Sarasvati? That is the, the question which the scholars immediately asked. You see, you have a hymn like this one, which is the Nadistuti Sukta, the hymn in praise of rivers. And there are 19 rivers which are named there. So we have a rare you know, geographical description, because Rig Veda doesn't care much about geography or history. It is not interesting in telling us, uh, you know, the historical or, or social or geographical background. This happens only by the way. And uh, then we have, the, you can see the hymn uh, either in Sanskrit or in English. And first of all, the very striking thing about this hymn is that it starts from the Ganges and it travels westward, Yamuna, Sarasvati will come back to her, Sutudri, which is Satlaj, Parushni, etc., Ashikni, which is Chenab. How do I, we know these identifications? Very simple, because of the Greek names. The Greeks, at the time of Alexander the Great, uh, visited India and gave names in Greece, like uh, Asiknes and so on, which were still close to the Vedic names. And uh, they describe the geography so well that there's no ambiguity. So we end up, in fact, we end up with Sindhu here. Kubaya is the Kabul River. The Gumatim is the Gumal, Gumal River. And Kurumum is the Kurum River, which are three Afghan tributaries of the Indus. So this is the geography of the Rigveda from Ganga to the Afghan rivers. First of all, why should the rivers be listed? And this is again, this is nothing but a pictorial depiction of the, the, what I have just shown you. In fact, this uh, mantra is remarkable because the Rishi, whoever wrote it, composed it, you know, had in his uh, mind's eye, if I may say so, had the entire geography of the Northwest. And in two, two uh, mantras, very briefly, the, it sweeps through the entire northwest. So that is remarkable, but why should that be done from east to west if the Aryans had come from west through the Kaiba Pass, this is a general assumption, or whatever pass, uh, they had come from west to east. This is very strange, and there's no explanation. The second point, of course, is the Sarasvati. And um, scholars who, like Max Miller and others, started translated the, the Rig Veda immediately uh, asked that question because they were not aware of any such river on the map. Actually, it was already there on the map. This is a, a map from 1760 that the earliest I found, a British map where you see here Sursuti, which is a small stream that still exists in Haryana and as a tributary of the Gagar, which is uh, uh, here written as Gugur or something. And um, so this was noted, and then, then there were topographic surveys in the early 19, 19th century by British officials who left very detailed records, and they actually made this quite clear that uh, there is the Sarsuti River here, and there is huge, well, fairly large, of, especially below, beyond this map, crossing Haryana which I spoke of the other day, the Ghagar, which is today a seasonal river uh, f because uh, m much of its waters are diverted to irrigation. Nevertheless, during strong monsoons, it still flows into Punjab. And uh, the first person in 1855 who proposed, you know, who put two and two, two plus two together, uh, and who said that, well, we have a big dry bed here between the Yamuna and the Sutledge, which is where Rig Veda tells us that Sarasvati is located, and therefore this must be the relic of the Sarasvati. Uh, this person was Louis Vivien de Saint Martin, French, very eminent in his days, a French geographer, who therefore proposed, and this was immediately accepted uh, by, <coughs> so this is a map incidentally by Alexander Cunningham, the founder of the Archaeological Survey of India, who wrote uh, very detailed book of ancient Indian geography. And this became the consensus. So you see 1881, this is a French book where identity between the Sarasvati and the Gagar. 
uh, then uh, you have a more detailed study in 83 by C.F. Aldam. Uh, you cannot read perhaps, but there is old Sarasvati written here. This is the Gagar. And you see how this continues. This is the Hakra. The, the name changes to Hakra in what is today Pakistan. And the bed goes on till and to up to the uh, uh, run of Kutch, the great run of Kutch. So this, is, this was the, the consensus. In fact, there was uh, no dispute. And Louis Renou, another uh, 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 great French Indologist in 19, who did a lot of work on the Vedas, um, he publishes this map. But this map corresponds to Mahabharata times, according to the geographic evidence in Mahabharata. And here, Mahabharata, as I mentioned the other day, mentions that the Sarasvati disappears in the sand. It is not the earliest text. There are earlier texts that do so, but I can't give all the details. At a point called Vinashana, of course, you understand what Vinashana means. And um, uh, there is Sarasvati, there is Dreshadvati. And this is the, and in fact, the, the whole of the Mahabharata, the, the war itself, uh, takes place in the region of Kurukshetra of the Sarasvati. So we have a literary continuity pointing to the loss of the river and only here not uh, there is no notion of uh, Sarasvati uh, at uh, Allahabad in those days and uh, this is what scholars have studied this is a German geographer in 1969 Herbert Wilhelmi uh, who actually tried to recreate all the phases of the Sarasvati from Vedic times when actually the Satlej instead of veering as it does today at Rupa today it turns here and this is today the Satlej but he makes it flow into the Sarasvati. And similarly, Yamuna, Yamuna make, he makes it flow into the Sarasvati. And it is assumed that some tectonic uplift drove away those two contributions from Satlej and Yamuna and depleted uh, the, the main sources of the Sarasvati, which was then left with only those streams uh, flowing down from the Shivalik hills, including the Ghagar. So whatever the, the, the exact mechanism, uh, we have also now remote sensing studies. This is one of the earliest ones. You see uh, the, the bed here uh, named Sarasvati. This is by uh, Isro and getting lost in the, what is today the Cholistan Desert of Pakistan. We have, of course, better images today. You can actually get better images on, right on your desktop uh, showing us the, the bed. And you see here, of course, the Ganga and, I'm sorry, um, yeah, this is Ganga and this is Yamuna. You, the Satlej now is here. So why is this bed so marked? Actually, it's an important point. It's not that uh, there is a deep valley. There is no deep valley. There is a slight depression. But there is an underground reserve of water still there. And uh, this uh, water has been dated by uh, isotopes. And it is quite compatible with uh, a few millennium BC. Uh, in fact, there is no modern recharge in this region. And uh, especially the dating has uh, taken place here in this part of uh, Rajas Western Rajasthan, Northwestern Rajasthan. And, uh, and what happens is that this underground reserve of water creates a different vegetation pattern on the surface. And uh, you can, in fact, it was noted by the British officials in the 19th century because they were considering using this route to march into Sindh and conquer Sindh. Uh, they abandoned the project because they were able to conquer Punjab first. And then from Punjab, they moved into uh, Sindh. This happened in the 1840s. And, uh, but they were considering using this route because they said that this the advantage of this dry bed is that there are lots of wells along the course and all those wells have sweet water, fresh water. Whereas if you move a few kilometers away, the wells have brackish water. This was noted in the 19th century reports and this, is <coughs> this has been verified by the Rajasthan Water Board in particular. So, <coughs> so this different vegetation pattern is what you see. More studies, I mean this could go on and on, <coughs> showing the paleo beds linking the Yamuna system with the Sarasvati system and the Satlej system with the, and in fact this is still sometimes a seasonal stream, it is called the Patyawali, I think, or the Sahind river. So plenty of <coughs> evidences, the last uh, 
is uh, the recent ISRO study showing the various causes of the Sarasvati because it has shifted its, its bed uh, several times like all the Indo-Gangetic rivers do. As you know, those plains are very flat. So any accumulation of alluvium or any tectonic change will cause those rivers to change course. This happens even today uh, in the Ganges plains, as you know. So, uh, so it, it comes all the way to the run of Kutch, which you see here. <coughs> and uh, this is, as a reminder, the, the site of Dholavira, which we visited the other day. So in any case, we have, and the reason I show all these names, I'm not going to read them out, is because there is a false impression created both in the media and by a certain class of uh, historians who object to the identification between the Gagar and the Sarasvati, that those who promote this identification are basically Hindutva people. And this is written, uh, you know, verbatim in articles after articles. And, you know, that those who say that this was a Sarasvati are basically Hindutva. Well, kindly decide whether all these scholars, and, I, and in my book you will have detailed references of their writings, whether they can all be Hindutva, I doubt. But uh, the, this is the consensus that this is the only possible candidate for the river that will match the description of the Rigveda, which is very simple, that the river lies between Yamuna and Satlej. So this is, of course, a strong argument against um, the Aryan invasion theory because we have seen that the river dries up uh, around 1900 BC. This is what the, actually, I'm going to show it now. And, uh, and uh, this is the whole question of the end of the Indus civilization. Previously, in the old books, uh, I'll show you the, another example now, the mechanism invoked was invasions. And this in civilization was supposed to have fallen to invasions. You know, it was a kind of a repetition of the story of the Roman Empire that falls to invasions by uh, barbarian tribes. <clears throat> so naturally, scholars were tempted to invoke similar mechanisms. Social unrest is also spoken of, but we don't have any very firm evidence for that. Great drought in 2200 BC, I'm coming to that. Drying up of the Sarasvati, you will see in the next slide. Ecological degradation is a very interesting um, uh, theory that uh, Harappans uh, overuse their resources, especially their forests, for all their industries, you know, their the pottery, metal, seal, um, bead industries, and that might have precipitated. Uh, geographical overstretch, maybe the civilization was over just too large a region, one million square kilometers, and the state structure that maintained it had to collapse at a certain point. This is also an interesting discussion. Finally, economic collapse. The end of the trade with the Mesopotamians is recorded in Mesopotamian tablets. After 1900 BC, Meluha totally disappears and is never spoken of again. So something happens. Now, is it a cause or is it a consequence? In fact, for all of these, this is the discussion. We may say that they are all factors in the end, but who, which one is exactly the cause is, is not very easy to determine. But there is a growing trend among scholars to prefer this, the, the uh, a pattern of ecological factors, this is 2000 BC, 4000 uh, year before present. And you can see here from different regions, this is Northeast India, this is Oman, uh, this is, where is this, I forget, <laughs> I forget. This is of course Japan, Italy, Tibetan Plateau. And uh, you find that there is a sudden drop in precipitation. There is actually a worldwide drought lasting for something like 200 years. And of course it would, and in fact it, uh, in Mesopotamia one particular kingdom fell because of it. This is now accepted. So whether this could be uh, uh, the cause of the end of the Indus civilization, possible, uh, at least it would have been a factor, important factor. But then see what happens in the Sarasvati Basin when you move from the early Harappan phase, before the urban phase, to the urban phase here, and the late, uh, the late Harappan phase, after the collapse of the urban order. So here you have a continuity of sites in the Sarasvati region. Then during the mature phase, one small break appears here at what is actually the international border uh, here today. And finally, a dramatic change after 1900 BC 
where all the central part of the Saraswati Basin is abandoned. Sites like Kalibangan, Kalibangan is here. Uh, Kalibangan actually is here. Disappears. People just go. So the assumption is that the Saraswati ceases to flow. And uh, of course, if the Saraswati, and this has been confirmed, these are my own maps, but you, you, I can show you many studies like this one from uh, International Team of Geologists, which appeared recently, uh, which shows the, this is a mature phase, you have almost perfect continuity, and then after, after 1900, suddenly all the central part, excuse me, it's here. All the central part is abandoned. So obviously, if this is the case, then, then I'm sorry, then uh, the Sarasvati dried up 1900 BC, but then the Aryans who composed the hymns on the banks of the Sarasvati and praised the river as flowing unbroken all the way to the sea, they cannot have done that in 1500 BC. There's no Sarasvati left in 1500 BC. So this, in fact, is the reason why some people stood up when this fact became clear in 1984, to be precise, the, all the data was correlated, and it was shown that Sarasvati in full flow meant third millennium BC, not second, third or even beyond. And then some people stood up and said, well, in that case, it cannot be the Sarasvati. So, well, fine, this is, uh, everybody has a right to his opinion, but then uh, the, the natural, logical consequence is that those who composed the Vedic hymns praising the Sarasvati in full flow did so before it dried up, and that would be uh, in the third millennium BC or beyond. So this also is a strong argument against the migration theory. Now, as far as the archaeological evidence is concerned, we must mention, because it is still in our textbooks, you see 1947, uh, this is about the kind of evidence we use in our textbooks today in India. <laughs> Though NCRT textbooks have improved, I must say, but uh, uh, in state boards of education, people just copy, you know, uh, from the previous writer. Uh, they, they, they don't realize that history textbooks need to be updated regularly. So we had a great archaeologist called Mortimer Wheeler, <coughs> who was sent in 1944 to India from the war front to salvage the Archaeological Survey of India, which was in a pretty bad shape. And he did a fantastic job. He woke up, he was extremely energetic, woke up the whole uh, sleeping survey, slumbering as he says, and uh, introduced very modern methods of stratigraphy, rigorous stratigraphy in excavations, which permitted a much better control of chronologies at sites that was not followed before him. And also, to his great credit, trained uh, generations of Indian archaeologists through various schools uh, and uh, uh, training camps in the field. But then he had also his pet theories. And uh, when uh, uh, you know, these skeletons were found in the streets of Mohenjo-daro, this is at Mohenjo-daro, 33 of them, later on 37 of them, then him, his imagination started working. And he said, well, this is the evidence of the final massacre, as he called it, of Mohenjo-daro. And he found, he said, who could be the, you know, the authors? Obviously, it has to be the Aryans, because don't forget that uh, Indra is the Purandara, he's the destroyer of the cities. If you take Pur to mean city, which is another big uh, issue, but I can't go into it today. And uh, therefore, he said, Indra, you know, the leader of the uh, Aryans, the Aryas, rather, stands accused. And uh, well, uh, this had a terrific effect, of course, and uh, people tended to be convinced because he was a very persuasive person. But uh, an American archaeologist in 1964, George Dales, uh, studied those skeletons more closely. He was uh, skeptical, and uh, he found that they actually did not belong to the same epochs. One S is missing at epoch. They were from different periods of time. So first of all, that is a big question mark. And they were, to his understanding, his interpretation, they were the result not of a massacre, but of a sloppy burial. And he asked, where are the burnt fortresses, the arrowheads, weapons, pieces of armor, the smashed chariots and bodies of the invaders and defenders? And there is absolutely no evidence of any kind that he was asking. So he called it a mythical massacre. In the 1980s, Another American, Kenneth 
Kennedy, who actually sadly passed away just a few months ago, uh, a brilliant bioanthropologist, I'm going to come back to him in a few minutes, studied the skeletons now much more closely because bioanthropology, that was his job, you know, to take the bones and, and try to find evidence of what happened or evidences of disease or all kinds of evidences. And he found that many of the injuries which uh, uh, Mortimer Wheeler had pointed to, the bones had apparently marked, marks of injuries, had actually healed before the death of the person. And, uh, and many of them were not injuries at all, but were the, just the result of post-mortem erosion. So then, then, of course, the whole uh, theory was discarded, and uh, Wheeler uh, accepted that uh, uh, he had pr promoted this theory. He said, um, uh, what, uh, what exactly was his quote? He said, in a lighter vein. But still he preferred to stick to it, nevertheless. Even in the last edition of this book, though he acknowledged that there were weaknesses, uh, he said still that's the best we can, we can do. Um, but ultimately, what archaeology tells us is that there is no evidence of invaders, and you know, especially in terms of artifacts. You would expect invaders to have left weapons, to have left uh, different types of tools, of uh, objects of daily use. Archaeologists are excellent at documenting all these material objects. This, there is no intrusive culture, as they say, towards the end of the Harappan civilization. <coughs> so I'm going to skip some of these quotations to save a little time. But I can just say that there is unanimity uh, uh, among the archaeologists uh, to, to say that we, there is absolutely no such evidence. And also, there is now an accepted time gap between the end of the Indus civilization and the... Uh, uh, so what people like Wheeler did to close this time gap is to say that the Indus civilization continued till 1700 BC and the Aryans actually might have invaded at that time earlier than thought. Of course, you can always play with dates, but uh, this is a, a, a posteriori uh, improvement. It's not just within the... Uh, actually, the problem is very complex, because if you want the Aryans to have come in, first of all, they would have crossed somewhere. Either they originate somewhere here in Central Asia, or if, as many scholars propose, they originate in Anatolia, or in the Black Sea, which would be somewhere here, or in southern Russia, which would be somewhere here, there is actually no consensus, even today, where the uh, Proto-Indo-Europeans, as they are called, uh, uh, um, originated from. In any case, they would have crossed all these regions, and uh, there are certain cultures which are uh, found in these regions. This is, for example, the Bactria Mahajana archaeological complex, a brilliant civilization of the Bronze Age, uh, of the contemporary with the Harappan civilization. And then you have post Harappan, you have the Gandhara grave culture in Swat, you have the cemetery age culture uh, in parts of the Indus Valley, you have the copper board culture, this is in the second million BC, and then later on the painted grey culture. And what I can say in brief is simple that there have been scholars to promote all of these as being. Aryan culture. But then, it's in, you know, you, you, you cannot have all of them. You have to choose. And the problem is that none of them actually covers the whole ground. You see, none of them uh, uh, covers the whole journey that the Harappans would have followed. Cemetery age has been promoted for a long time as being evidence. It is visible, it was first visible at Harappa, at a place, a, a cemetery, in fact, called Cemetery Age. And it was thought to be the result of the incoming Aryans. But then later on, and this is what has happened with most of these cultures, it was shown to be in continuity with the, uh, uh, the, the, the final stages of the urban culture. So there is actually no cultural break. And this is what we see for all of these cultures. And none of them actually provides a good explanation for an invading uh, a people. So then I have to spend a few minutes on the horse issue because there is an argument which is presented and it has to be dealt with both textually and archaeologically, which is, and you remember our first little textbooks, 
that the Aryans introduced basically the horse in the subcontinent. Uh, it is a fact that Rig Veda constantly speaks of Ashwa, horse, horse-drawn chariots, and therefore some scholars will say that the horse is central to Vedic culture. And then they say further that there are no horse remains in the Indus cities and no horse depictions in Indus art. Therefore, Harappan civilization cannot reflect a Vedic culture and the Vedic age is post-Harappan. Now, seen like that, the arguments, argument seems to be very strong. But it has many flaws. First of all, it is not true that the, no horse remains have been found in the Harappan civilization. Twelve Harappan sites have come up with bones or teeth identified by the best archaeozoologists, as they are called. Uh, many of them Indian, and I must say at this point that there was a bit of bias against Indian archaeozoologists. They were not taken seriously, and you know they were said to confuse um, uh, the horse bones with the bones of the wild ass. And it is true that the wild ass has bones which are similar to the horse bones, but then the Indian archaeozoologists were all the time, like A.K. Sharma for instance, were all the time claiming that they could distinguish between the two. So here, for instance, we have at Surkotada, which is a site in Gujarat, in, during the mature phase, we have bones which have been identified by this A.K. Sharma as, tom, as bones of the horse, the true horse. And uh, well, uh, initially, you know, there was, uh, it was just ignored. But then it so happens that one day, an international expert, the late Hungarian archaeologist Sender Bakunyi, <coughs> visited India and saw the bones at the archaeological survey uh, in Delhi. And he studied them and he said this is not only the true horse, this is a domesticated true horse because some teeth had marks which can be done only by, you know, a horse bit, the, the biting of a horse bit. So this triggered now this, that we had a, a non-Indian asserting that the horse was present at Surkotada. People stood up and took notice. And uh, it triggered a fierce debate. And some scholars like Richard Meadow, who is a fine US archaeologist, but determined not to find any horse remains at all in the Indus civilization, wrote a very lengthy paper where he tortured the evidence and said that, no, this is the wild ass. Now he. Uh, uh, kindly invited uh, Sender Bakuni to give a reply, which he did, and he, the argument was extremely detailed, and Sender Bakuni stuck to his uh, opinion that this was not the wild ass, but the domesticated horse. Uh, Richard Meadow gave a second rejoinder. By the time Bakuni uh, could give his final, re actually he had passed away, unfortunately. So the de debate died, and now you have historians uh, claiming that, uh, that this has been proved to be the wild ass. But the funny part is that when people try to trace migrations of Indo-Europeans through uh, Europe and uh, they follow the evolution of the horse, supposedly again, you know, brought into Europe by the same uh, proto-Indo-Europeans, who do they refer to to send a Bukhani? This is the final authority always quoted, and I've given in some papers, uh, many references that he is always quoted as the supreme authority. So he is accepted in Europe, but he is not accepted back home. So this is a little uh, unfair in my opinion. And uh, uh, therefore, we cannot say that the horse did not exist in the Harappan civilization. In fact, the same Mortimer Wheeler, whom I showed you, and who, as you saw, was a, a great uh, defender of the Aryan invasion theory, acknowledged that they were bones of a horse at Mohenjo-daro, though a higher level, but the levels were unfortunately not dated, so we cannot offer a firm date. But from Ranagundai, which is in Baluchistan, uh, earliest and doubtless pre-Harappan layers. So this much he accepted even in his days, 1968. And he said it is likely enough that camel, horse, and ass were in fact all a familiar feature of the Indus caravan. So you see that some very orthodox scholars do not have a problem accepting that the horse uh, exists. Do we have no depictions? Well, uh, this is again debated. You have to decide whether this found in Lothal, this figurine found in Lothal in Gujarat, uh, does it represent a horse or a dog or something else? 
uh, the tail is bushy, which is why uh, Dr. S. R. Rao, the late archaeologist who excavated there, identified it as a horse. But it's, I agree that it is open to debate. However, this one in Mohenjo-daro, uh, identified by Ernest Mackey <coughs> in the 1930s as a horse, <coughs> does look like a horse, especially with the elongated uh, neck. And uh, well, the, uh, this is about all we have. There are a few more, but they are pretty indistinct. And it is true that the Harappans did not clearly depict the horse, for example, on seals, on pottery. There is no such depiction. But if you do not depict an animal, it doesn't prove that it doesn't exist. They do not depict the cow ever. Yet they were bulls. We know that they depicted the bull and they were, uh, you know, bull horses. So there must have been cows. Um, camel, camel horses, uh, camel bones have been found, quite a few, uh, but the, it's never, the animal is never depicted. The cat, the wolf, the lion, the jackal are never depicted, yet they existed in the Harappan environment. So we cannot take non-depiction as a, a, you know, a proof in itself. If bones have been found, uh, that should be enough. Furthermore, lots of points uh, which I will have to mention very briefly, but they are very important because they show how we can, you know, m uh, uh, treat an argument in the wrong way. We can have a wrong methodology. People say the Aryans brought the horse. Therefore, we should, we should expect an increase in horse bone remains and depictions after 1500 BC. Do we have? Answer is no. There's absolutely no increase in horse bone remains uh, after 1500 BC or depictions. In fact, the horse is never depicted in India, almost. There are a few sites which do give a few horse figurines. But in a big way, it's only in the Mauryan Empire that the horse suddenly is a glorified animal. Previous to that, it's only the bull, the elephant, uh, basically. Um, in the Rig Veda, and this is the, 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 the biggest uh, secret of the horse argument, which nobody debates, and I, I stumbled upon it one day while going through carefully to all the passages in the Rig Veda that mention the horse. In fact, it is not just the Aryas that have Ashwa, it is also the Dasyus. The adversaries of the Aryas also have horses, and I can give you at least eight passages to prove that. So if the Ashwa, if Ashwa means the horse, then it is as well a non-Vedic animal. It is also with non-Vedic populations. Then the, all, the whole argument that the horse should be a marker of Vedic culture, which is what many scholars insist upon, falls flat. So you see that the argument is not, uh, I'll give just briefly one uh, example. Uh, which is that uh, Ushas, the, uh, to show the, the complexity of interpreting the Rig Veda, Ushas, the, the dawn, is praised in one hymn as Gomati Ashwavati. Now, if you look at the 19th century translators, British translators, they translate Gomati is full of cows and Ashwavati is full of horses. So this is dawn. But Go is accepted also as being light. You see, cow, milk, light. So go, and any standard dictionary <coughs> in Sanskrit, go is also the light. That is well accepted. <coughs> but what Sri Aurobindo said in 1915, before the discovery of the Indus civilization, is that Ashwa does not mean actually the physical animal. It means speed and energy, not, uh, not uh, always the animal. In that case, his translation is dawn full of light and energy. Now you kindly decide which of the two you want. Uh, but this shows you the difficulty, the risk <coughs> in mechanically interpreting terms of the Rig Veda. <coughs> now I'm going to very quickly mention, uh, I'll take five minutes uh, to close this lecture. It's a huge topic. I knew I would be running uh, behind times, but it doesn't matter. Um, we, uh, we have important, very, imp I'll just summarize. I'm not going to read all this. I'll just summarize. Very important skeleton studies taking place since the 1990s. The issue is very simple. Can we identify through skeleton studies a different human type? Suddenly, suppose South Americans had entered or Chinese people had entered uh, India in the second millennium BC. 
you would be able to detect it because there would be different physical features. And the big answer is no. Uh, Kenneth Kennedy, the same, and many of his colleagues, and Indian colleagues also, all studied hundreds of skeletons belonging to the Harappan civilization and belonging to the later phases. And they said there is essentially no difference. And what we see, they said, is that there is biological continuity, which means that the Harappans were basically the ancestors of today's Gujaratis, today's Rajasthanis, today's Punjabis, today's Sindhis. They were themselves of different physical types. This is not as if the Harappans were a tightly homogeneous population. But they failed to see, and that is why Kennedy, for example, in many of his papers, has emphatically rejected the Aryan invasion theory. I'm going to have to skip the genetic evidence, uh, but I can simply mention that we have now, since uh, the last 15, 20 years, yes, there is a burn smell, so, so please look around, and uh, in case you detect anything, it, it could be a Vedic fire somewhere, <laughs> but the, the genetic evidence is that things are very complicated and when we plot the, I, I will skip the rest, when we plot the genetic evidence uh, and the DNA of many populations, we would expect Brahmins, you know, to be, or Punjabis who are on the path of the supposed Aryans to be very close to Central Asia. In fact, in fact we find Gujaratis and Chenchus, which are the Dravidian tribe of Andhra Pradesh, among the closest. So there is something wrong and the genetic uh, evidence is this? No, no, it is not wrong, it is not wrong. Oh. So I can't uh, read uh, all this, but there are a few, let me jump to the conclusion of the genetic studies because they are so important. Number one, they do not accept uh, genetists today do not accept the concept of Adivasi. They say we cannot determine which is the earliest population in India. So this concept, which is colonial, I mean it was the British government which uh, set it up, has no scientific definition. Secondly, surprisingly, there is no, not much genetic difference between tribes, low caste and high caste. In fact, the genetic evidence clusters geographically. A Brahmin of South India is closer genetically to South Indian tribes than to a Brahmin of North India. So these are the uh, findings. And uh, anyone interested, please mail me. I have a whole paper on this with lots and lots of uh, references to recent papers, at least 20 recent papers of genetic uh, studies. So therefore, the concept of an Aryan race or a Dravidian race is, uh, in fact, the very concept of race. Today, uh, if you ask a biologist, cannot be defined scientifically. South Indians also did not, according to genetic evidence, are long settled. It is not as if the Dravidians, who are supposed to have been also invading from the Mediterranean, according to some models, are also long settled in India. In fact, all major populations, except some fringe populations, especially in the northeast, we do know that some uh, tribal communities migrated from, from Burma, from China, uh, but otherwise, Otherwise, all populations are said to be settled in India for at least 40,000 years. So therefore, Arivasi loses all its meaning. In fact, a number of studies, you can see the names at the bottom, now propose that humanity came first to out of Africa into northwest uh, uh, of the subcontinent, and from there went into all other parts of the world. Uh, in that case, except for Africans, all humans would have ancestors in, in Northwest India. These are some of the current theories. It is still, you know, the genetics is a very fresh field, but um, uh, this is what it is. Now, very, just one minute and I will close to show that the uh, archaeological evidence also does not agree that there is a cultural gap or break between Harappan, supposedly pre-Vedic, and Gangetic, supposedly Vedic. You just uh, see certain things like this Harappan swastika, 
uh, fire altars have been found at several sites and can have no other explanation. For example, at Banawali, uh, one foot thick of ash was found in this structure which cannot serve any other purpose, obviously. So fire worship, this is from Kalibangan, a row of seven fire altars. Uh, this is in Gujarat. And um, <coughs> worship of Linga and Trishul, which evoke worship of Shiva. And Shiva is a Vedic god. He appears uh, with his full name in the Yajurveda. In Rigveda, he is only as Rudra. Then uh, uh, various characters uh, po uh, seated in uh, yogic postures uh, with three faces. Uh, you know, it, this gives us a context which is uh, some, something is familiar to us in this. Even the Harappan unicorn, uh, the concept of a, a bull with a sharp horn or sharpened horn exists in the Rig Veda and in Mahabharata where Krishna says that Ekashringa was his former old name. So we have such bridges which you know need further study and uh, can be interpreted in many ways but also the evidence of yoga you, re you, you recognize here from Harappan figurines some well-known posture possible uh, practice of meditation this uh, important figure is shown in deep contemplation so these uh, point to a certain cultural continuum which at least all these scholars have stressed even from John Marshall in 1931 uh, stressed the fact that actually there is no break there is no significant break or hiatus between uh, uh, between Indus and Ganges phase and the previous concept of a dark age in the second millennium BC this is found still in many textbooks is no longer valid says uh, US archaeologist James Schaffer so the cities disappear but the culture lives on and uh, through what mechanism I will try to explain in my next talk uh, on the Ganges civilization so the conclusions the Aryans remain elusive they are so elusive that and maybe that is the best tribute we can give them that archaeologists have completely stopped talking about the Aryans in the archaeological literature of the past 15 or 20 years archaeologists just don't want to hear about Aryans anymore they can explain the whole evolution of cultures in the subcontinent without invoking Aryans or anybody else so therefore, but then since we have no physical, bioanthropological or genetic evidence for them, some scholars have proposed that okay, they did not invade brutally, they migrated <coughs> and since there is no evidence for physical evidence, they migrated in very, very small numbers. And one scholar, even, one scholar a famous uh, linguist Michael Witzer even said that one Afghan tribe overstaying in India would have been enough. So you kindly decide if it is enough, it co he calls it the trickle-in theory. So we don't have an invasion, we don't even have a migration, we have a trickling-in of Aryans. But whether this can be rationally you know, uh, justified be, uh, to explain that these uh, trickled-in people could have overturned the entire linguistic, cultural, social landscape of India, that is the big issue. Um, well, it remains mainstream, especially because of linguistic support, but my point is that uh, why continue to teach this divisive theory, which has been increasingly challenged and carries such a heavy colonial baggage. So um, I'm sorry I exceeded the time a little bit, but this is a huge topic and I did my best to show you that... <laughs>